I'm reading the comments here. So someone named Oki99 asked if they should pay Rabbi Chaim Kaufman for conversion guidance. We, we actually talked about that last time. Yeah, we week, spoke so about this know. last time. The person is sincerely asking this question. I think I should answer it for, all, mm -hmm. for, for everyone listening. I'm not questioning Chaim Kaufman's character. I just think that there's enough free content online, Torah classes, even guidance you could get for free, that why would you ever want to pay for it? Especially, I, I mean, not, especially the fact that he doesn't even give you a garris, that he doesn't give you a mikvah, he doesn't even bring you to right. bed then, he doesn't do anything. No, but you say for you guidance, because I'm sure like he could tell you where to go, but I'll give you that information for free. And one, I also converted, and I made Aliyah, and I like jumped through all the hoops, so I know what it takes to convert. He didn't convert, he was born Jewish, so he has an outsider's perspective of how it actually works. I'll give you the advice for free of where to go. You tell me what community you live in. I'll put you in contact with the Beit Din and the synagogue that you should He's go. He's from Oklahoma, uh, the yeah. man's land. Well, Oklahoma, like if you're not in Tulsa, there's a Chabad in Tulsa outside of that. Uh, but anyways, no one should be paying for Torah classes. I remember there was one Torah class that I paid for for a while. Rabbi Yisachar Friend, these classes were meant to be paid. I mean, but the guy is on such a high level that you're always going to learn so much from his little class, but he never posted it online. I think it was like $5 a class. I mean, I collected almost all his classes. But especially people who are in Judaism 101 in the initial stages or even of thinking to become Jewish, there's so much out there for introduction to Judaism classes that you should never pay for anything. Rabbis who are a lot more charismatic than I am, than for sure than Rabbi Kaufman is. I don't think that you should be paying anyone for Torah classes. And if for some reason you can't move into a Jewish community, I mean, that's the ideal. You should move into a Jewish community and receive the most recognized conversion you could possibly have. We also perform conversions for free in South Florida, not recognized by everyone. But in case you wanted to go back to Oklahoma and start a synagogue in your house, the heck, we'll convert you. I perform more conversions than probably anyone alive. First and Sunday every month. First Sunday of every month. Come to South Florida. Absolutely free. We'll also we marry you for free. Barbecue too, maybe? Maybe, maybe. Oh, ooh, big blowout. Fourth of July blowout. Clyde says, I'm moving to South Florida. So now I know you went to Yeshiva. Now, the stuff that you know, that you st this is stuff that you found out after you left Yeshiva, right? Correct. From, uh, absolutely. Study. So what exactly did you learn in yeshiva other than, I'm guessing, Hebrew and, and like a structured way of learning? I can't speak for yeshivas in America, but in Israel, about two yeshivas have an opon. So yes, I mean, they teach you Hebrew, uh, but I don't think the average American yeshiva has an opon. The Hebrew you learn there is just by going through the Chumash or the Gemara. I started off in an intermediate program, and when I left yeshiva, I was in the base metrics program. But there's also an earlier stage for people who don't know nothing about Judaism, called essentials, at least in yeshiva I was in, because I was in Asia Torah in Jerusalem. You mostly learn Mishnah Brura. This whole notion that they encourage questioning is nonsense. Sure, you can ask a question, but if you disagree with the answer, I mean, they'll kick you out of the <laughs> shear. The bulk of your learning is going to be done via independent learning, online reading or just reading books, or just reading codifications on your own or translating codifications on your own. The curriculum was that we had a Mishnah Torah class. My Rebbe, Rabbi Resnick, I mean, I don't know if he would acknowledge being my Rebbe, but um, he was to a certain extent. So he taught Mishnah Torah. Like he was the Rambam guy in Mishnah Torah. Then there's Parsha HaShavua class every day where you go through the Parsha. And there's a Gemara class. And it's more teaching you how to learn than really indoctrinating you in a more serious yeshiva. Now, overall, it's all an indoctrination, but it's not eight hours of uh, Rabbi Mizrahi lectures. It's more a systematic form of learning, understanding pages of Gemara, but really trying to understand the arguments, but not coming to conclusions, because no one really takes halacha from the Talmud nowadays, because we have codifications, we have Shohan Aruch, we have Mishnah Torah. So it's really teaching you how to argue, teaching you how to think in a Talmudic manner. That's really what you're learning, the bulk of it. Well, there's some specialty classes. I remember... In my yeshiva, there was this rabbi named Malti Berger. So Malti Berger was one of the first counter-missionaries. Like probably when, when 
Gerald Siegel and Rabbi Singer started out, like he was pretty famous. He was from Asia Torah. He was part of the Discovery Seminar. There was this Asia Torah Seminar that would travel the world giving classes of uh, the Bible codes and trying to convince unaffiliated Jews to become more religious. There were specialty classes, like his was a specialty class, which was a counter-missionary class, learn how to respond to missionaries. There's a class by Gerald Schroeder. So Gerald Schroeder is pretty famous now. And he dealt with science. He was a physicist from MIT who, who became religious and was teaching in Asia Torah, belief in God within science. He has a whole series on breaking down the days of creation as not literal days, but instances of billions of years, whatever. He's pretty intense. There was also a Kabbalistic Hasidic class that people were encouraged to go to. You guys probably see him online. His name is Rabbi Yontov Glazer. That's funny. That's the only class that I dropped out of in Asia Torah because I got into a big argument with him the first week. I guess I would really define who I would become in the Orthodox world. I don't teach against Kabbalah. I just say it's not obligatory to believe. That's a glimpse into my yeshiva career. And I was telling people in the comments section, you have to show up uh, pre-cut when, if you want to come for a conversion if you're male, right? Circumcised, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're not doing any circumcisions. <laughs> okay. You can't convert someone if they're healing. They typically time it to 30 days. That it would take 30 days from an actual circumcision to perform a conversion for the person to heal. So it's not a hafsaka, like a separation between the water and the person. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Uh, someone wants to know: Would you be willing to have a once a month class discussing uh, on the on a mission tour class, like a mission tour learning class? Uh, I started doing that. I have maybe like eight classes like that going to mission tour. But oh, you have it up on your YouTube. Yeah, I started going through Hilchot Shabbat. There's enough people doing that online. I try to bring something different to the table. Any one of you guys could go through Mishnah Torah. The purpose of Mishnah Torah, the Rambam writes in his Hakdama that this was meant to be studied by laymen alone. It was now, really meant to take the power from the rabbis. Correct. So nowadays you're like, oh, well, you can't learn it unless some rabbi teaches you this statement that you can't understand even the Torah without a commentary. Then what's the point of God giving you a book if you can't understand it without a commentary? Now, I understand that it can be implemented on a national level if there isn't a consensus on how you keep ceremonial laws. That's clear. It seems like God even tells them to determine months and that it's the elders that had a responsibility to keep everything uniform. But to say that even when the author of the Mishnah Torah tells you that now that you have my Mishnah Torah, you don't need all their books, you don't need other commentaries. Now rabbis are saying, no, you can't understand Mishnah Torah without a commentary. Yeah, these people don't know what they're talking about. You would still have to understand what the Hebrew words mean if you wanted to do it in Hebrew. Like, granted, there's different gear seal, there's different versions of the Mishnah Torah out there, and some change the halacha a little slightly, but I mean, you could probably count the changes in two hands. If you read it in English, you'll still probably come up head and shoulders above 99% of all the rabbis out there who think they know Judaism by just going to the Mishnah Torah because that covers everything. And that you don't need someone to give a class on. I also don't understand classes on Torah either. No offense to you, J-Dub, but to have someone read the Torah straight through, well, you can read it alone. I don't need it. Don't push away self-study. Self-study is very important. The bulk of this, you guys could learn on your own. Like You don't need a rabbi to just read you something that you could read on your own. Oh, well, it was different if the rabbi reads it? It's actually better if you read it alone. Because in areas that you don't understand, you'll go back and read it again. Instead of like holding back the whole class and telling the rabbi, Rabbi, I don't understand. And then you'll be embarrassed. And then, now, if you have what's called the Rav Muvhak, and this is really what you see with bands in the Talmud, the students of Hillel and Shammai, and even the students of Jesus, Someone who teaches you everything from you not knowing anything, that's not what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with people who are religiously mature, but perhaps may not be too knowledgeable in Judaism. Yeah, but people who came from a belief system that elevated the Bible. The problem with rabbis now is they're always talking down to you, especially no eyed rabbis, because they're for sure in the position of saying what's good for me is not good for you. Right? But I'm telling you that whatever I've attained, you could attain as well. And you guys really should be listening to Amen. lectures that are geared and taught by rabbis for rabbis, because that's what you should strive to be. Even if you're a woman, 
I'm not saying that a woman should strive to have the title rabbi, but should strive to know as much and more than any rabbi. Why not? This was the goal of the Rambam, to put the power in your hands. This is the purpose of Mishnah Torah, to cut out the middleman. No, but then, I mean, Shulchan Aruch comes in now that you need a middleman to understand Shulchan Aruch. If you need someone to tell you how to live your religion, then your religion itself is not that impressive. It sounds kind of ridiculous because it seems that it's too easily corruptible, that someone could sort of move in and knock you towards the wrong direction. Because that's what happened when you let people tell you what God wants you to do. Another important thing with self-study is that you're able to determine what's important to you instead of having someone else tell you what's important. That's the difference between a shiur and self-study. That's the difference between watching the news on TV and reading a newspaper. When you read a newspaper, you decide what's important. No, the TV is going to bombard you with opinion. But what you want is the brass tacks. You want the facts. And then you're able to decide and also be mechadesh. Come out with your own chidushim and share your insights with the rest of the world. Yeah. Well, I can't really say that. I don't know about the news and newspapers, Rav. That's all fake news propaganda nowadays. But I understand what you're saying. It's, It's just like the difference between brainwashing and education. Brainwashing is just basically telling you the answer and repeating it, whereas education is... I'll give you the tools and you'll learn yourself, basically. Right. At least in this class, you guys could question. I mean, you guys could say... True. There's many people who say, I don't agree with everything you say, whatever. Heck, if I only hung out with people who uh, accepted everything I say, I'd be alone because I'm very opinionated. Now, mind you, there's people on YouTube who say weirder things that I say, and I don't really say weird things that everyone... But I've heard people say, I agree 100% with what a YouTube rabbi teaches. It shows that you don't know enough about Judaism to disagree. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's impressive. You should be embarrassed to say something like that. Even as a Christian, if you belong to a church and you agree 100% with what the pastor says, the problem Preach is not it. with the pastor, the problem is with you. It means that you're not thinking. There's different ways of looking at things. There's even, there's even the possibility to have three opinions according to the Bible, and all those three opinions be right. Because there's ambiguous notions. There's notions that go three ways. Let's there is something about, about Judaism. There is something about having a harusa, though. I mean, don't, don't expel it com- outright completely, right? You're not throwing it out, right? Com- I mean, there is something to it. I mean, it's, it's nice to have a study buddy. Right, a haruta is basically a study buddy. I don't think it's necessary, absolutely, but it's nice to get your ideas bounced off other people. There's a statement in Perkavot that says, a selech harav. So there, the Rambam brings down to, to make for yourself teachers, but even people who know less than you, ideally to bounce your ideas off, to have someone to study Torah with, but not the twisted notion how it's taught nowadays that you have to have one teacher who teaches you everything and nonsense. Rabbi Lichtenstein made the famous statement that it says that that means to have only one teacher like the previous statement means to have only one friend because it also says to make unto yourself a friend but no one's going to assume that it only means to have one friend in life no that one should have many teachers one should have many friends but have different outlets of torah again heresy is not such a huge fear here torah observance is what's important okay all these these classifications as heretic, apicorus, men, kofer, all these things are post mishnaic Back then, people weren't so preoccupied with this. This really goes wild in the era of the Amorayim, all this name-calling, because Judaism became too dogmatic. It wasn't only about keeping halacha and Torah. Now it's like, we want to know what you believe as well. Why do you care what I believe? I believe what I'm convinced of. God's going to punish me for not being convinced of something. What kind of God do we worship here? I'm not convinced. I'm not. If I'm debating a Christian... And he's not convinced that JC is not the Messiah, right? He's not convinced. What, am I going to get mad at the guy? No. I'm going to get mad if he's disagreeing with Torah, if he's not keeping mitzvot. We have to stop playing thought police here. We can't adjudicate people for what they think or what they believe. Torah wants us to judge people on how they behave. And that's it.